Perception is not always reality. Howard Kale and together with Mark Volman were the founding members of the Turtles. Let me refresh your memory, people. Please. One of the biggest hits. One of the biggest hits. Happy together. Then there's that Eleanor thing. And it's not me, babe. Hey, great fun music from guys that seem to really uh, be carefree. Then they became Flo and Eddie, and they, they joined up with Frank Zappa's band, and the fun continued. Wow, did it. Howard Kalen Shocker, My Life with the Turtles, Flo and Eddie, and Frank Zappa, etc., Shell Shocked is a perception killer that will have you saying, are you freaking kidding me? Just about through the entire book. Shell Shocked is available wherever digital downloads are found, including Amazon. And we have to say, people, wherever legal digital downloads are found. The website, howardkalen.com, there's a Y in there. K-A-Y-L-A-N. So it's howardkalen.com. The author, founding member of the Turtles, and Eddie. All three of those people are here right now. Please welcome Howard Kalen to the Mark Berman Show. How you doing? Hey, hello, hello, hello. All three of us are great, Mark. <laughs> um, we'll talk about the Turtles, but this book is absolutely from a band that you started with Mark Volman, came up with this great music. It's everything totally that we would not expect. There's nothing that that that's in this book that we expect and perception is not reality is it not in my case sir um, <laughs> i have got to say reality is a very subjective uh, subject anyway and especially when you're talking about somebody who grew up in the rather uh, drug intense uh, 1960s uh, so uh, as you know from reading the book, we were literally thrown right out of high school onto the Dick Clark Caravan of Stars, and that was our education. I consider that I got my um, my bachelor's degree in the Turtles, uh, my master's <laughs> degree in, in the Mothers of Invention, and, and Flo and Eddie's where I got my doctorate. Okay. So let's get into this. After the forward by Penn Jillette and the acknowledgments from you and, and co-writer Jeff Tamarkin, our perception is questioned with, and I quote, and to my listeners, you're going to read this very on. I was snorting coke on Abraham Lincoln's desk in the White House, and that's the first time I said, are you freaking kidding me? Um, okay. <laughs> well, you know what? Um they told me at the publishing office, uh, I, I'm new to this game, as you know, you can be an old soul when it comes to making music or even making television and movies, but when it comes to writing a book, I was a brand new novice author. So when the publisher said, all I need is an opening line that is going to just guarantee that the reader is going to want to keep going, the first thing that crossed my mind was something as ludicrous as, as our snorting coke had been at the White House. It, it just seems like such a bizarre way to begin the book, such a strange juxtaposition of uh, the turtles and, and the way we were perceived by America, talking about perception not being everything, and yet what we really were as a band, which was a bunch of experimental kids from Southern California who were trying to set trends, not just follow them, but wound up being in a, in a whole bunch of bizarre circumstances and, and finding out that we were novices in just about every single area that we attempted. The book goes into detail, but why were you at the White House anyway? Uh, was it uh, Easter egg hunt, or uh, what were you there for? <laughs> we, were, uh, we were there on a special invitation. We had gotten these special engraved invitations from Tricia Nixon herself, uh, uh, Tricky Dick's daughter. Um, it was her <laughs> coming out party. It was her 16th birthday. And the Turtles had released an album uh, just prior called Battle of the Bands, which included uh, the hit songs Eleanor and You Showed Me. You Showed Me, in particular, had been Trisha's favorite song. She just loved it. But it was a sappy ballad with a lot of strings. And I guess she did a lot of slow dancing with other Republicans in those days. <laughs> So 
She was up for it, and uh, she, uh, she was publicly quoted as saying that the Turtles were her favorite group. And the White House at that point spared no expense, and they sent us these letters of invitation, to which the entire band replied, No, we're not going to go. We don't like Mr. Nixon. We don't like what he's doing to our country. We think the war in Vietnam is stupid. We see our friends not coming home from their tours, and their tours were hairier than ours. We were just touring America as a rock band. When these guys toured, they went on their first, second, and third, third tour of Vietnam and Cambodia and Saigon, and it was a miracle that any of them came back, but many of them didn't, and it changed our entire attitude toward America, uh, toward the war, uh, which, of course, we were against, but as white, middle-class kids, it was very, very hard to protest anything. Because in many cases, when we first started making records, we were living at home with our parents. I mean, sure. what do you have to protest when you're a 17 year old white kid with a scholarship to UCLA and a car, and your parents are giving you everything, and yet you're supposed to react to all the inequities in the world and, and to the war and to the violence and, and the horrors that were going on in Washington, D.C.? We were very conflicted. And uh, we told our management at the time, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation, but there's no way in hell that we're going to play Richard Nixon's White House. And uh, management explained to us, look, you guys, you can't get political. What do you mean you can't get political? It's the White House. <laughs> no, no, no. This is like an invitation from the Queen. Whether or not you like the Queen, you show up because you were officially invited. And as an American citizen, it's sort of your right. My right. It was my right to be almost drafted into the war, too, and I wouldn't have come home with legs. It's not my right. It was, it was my obligation. I kind of looked at it as an obligation. I believe had we not performed for that invitation, um, I, I might be on some list someplace right now. Uh, and I still might, but not because of this. Uh, so we show up at the White House. We all went out and bought, you know, $1,500 Briani suits at the time, and we all looked spiffy, and we played nice with others, and uh, we had a real good time there, maybe too good a time at the White House, but those are little insights that are in the pages of my book that aren't really public knowledge, and, and they shouldn't be. Um, there are some things that were confined to secrecy until I let everything out of the bag. And I will tell you, as somebody who has read the book all the way through, Mark, um, it drew me into therapy. I mean, uh, if there's no way that you can um, open as many dark doorways as I did. It came out, yeah. Yeah, and in the telling of that book and not feel like, boy, I, I dropped the ball 20 years ago. I dropped the ball 25 years ago. I, I dropped it 15 years. I mean, there were a lot of people uh, that I sort of left in my wake that I felt if I didn't make it right in the book, I would have to kind of make it right in person. Uh, so I've, I've gone back and I've talked to a lot of these people that were very important figures early on uh, in the Mothers and the Turtles um, in the formation of Flo and Eddie, the band, and the company uh, that's even bigger than the band at this point, um, just to find out if I'd stepped any toes uh, on any toes, if there was anything reversible, if there was anything... I could do to make the situation better, and I found that nine times out of ten, it was all inside my head. I had to make my head feel better, uh, and for that, I needed help. You can write about all of your hardships, yeah. write about all of your um, down periods and, and how it made you feel, but until you start literally confessing and getting it all out of your system, um, you're holding back and I didn't want to hold back anymore. I'm 66 years old, the time has sure. Come. I'll tell the tales. I thought I was going to write a more detailed book later in my life about my adventures, and that this particular book would be a very sort of surface trip through my um, professional chronology. But uh, when you look in the mirror and you see that you're 66 years old, you realize there may not be time to separate <laughs> your life into a separate chronology. This might be it. Let's put the pen to the paper and do it. So last summer... Uh, on tour 
uh, is when the book was written. It was written entirely on the road. It was written entirely on an iPad, and it was edited on my iPhone. And uh, all the pictures uh, came to me from uh, contributors all over the country, as well as my own uh, personal files. So there's a lot of stuff there that, that has never been seen before and will never be seen again. Uh, it was really kind of a, a strip naked uh, sort of experience to write this book. Uh, I realize that I'm not as famous as Keith Richards, and that will keep a percentage of readers away. But I will say that um, I have not in any way, shape, or form told any lies in this book. Everything I've been through in my last uh, 66 years on the planet is, uh, is documented and told about. And uh, I think that the people who are into the 60s, into the music of the 60s, into imagining what it could have been like back then to to be friendly with the Beatles or to know Jimi Hendrix or to hang out with these people in Laurel Canyon that um, that are icons now that were just roommates then. Um, that sort of thing is the insight that I, I most wanted out of the book. I, I really didn't want to name names and, and start being you know, a, a nasty little kid about this. This is not a vindictive book. Um, but I did have some people from my past, my second wife, for instance. Uh, when of five. Up. Second of yeah. five. Yeah, so okay. Who's counting? Uh, I am. That's right. I, okay. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. I have a question for you. Sure. Everything you're saying seems to be Los Angeles, but you're a New York kid, and you didn't move until your father took a job in L.A. Yeah, but I was really not much of a kid in New York State. I really didn't have the chance to to grow at all because I had, first of all, I had a very low opinion of myself, I think, growing up as a young kid. Uh, I'm not sure if I can blame my parents for that or whether I should just blame myself. I think everything comes down to the self, ultimately. I just had a very low opinion, and I, I didn't really have a whole lot of friends uh, growing up uh, as a young kid. I just remember myself being packed into snow suits and being thrown onto a big yellow school bus and just watching the clock the entire day waiting for the school bus to come and take me back. Um, I wasn't vested in it, and, uh, and I had so many bizarre little things happen to me as a kid. Um, my kindergarten teacher taking us to the cemetery to see where her husband was buried and, and telling us how, <laughs> right. much better, how much better life will be for then in the un, uh, uh, unrelenting and everlasting peace that we would soon be achieving next to her husband. Well, that wasn't setting well with these five-year-olds. <laughs> So, I mean, there was a lot of crap going on in my youth, and um, and my parents uh, were fighting, and there were some, I believe, um, adulterous situations going on. Even as a very young kid, it was easy to perceive. So I think I was kind of messed up. Uh, and before, uh, before I knew it, I was in California, and I was old enough to realize what was going on around me and to make my own decisions at the age of 10. I mean, I was sort of uh, left to my own devices. Uh, my parents were very supportive of my music and my writing and all that stuff. Uh, but when it came to the everyday little things that every kid should have learned by that age, um, how to swim, how to dance, how to, how to do anything socially redeeming, uh, those were qualities that I don't believe my parents had. So they couldn't have passed it on to me. I was a real outsider when it came to things social. And I kept in that little shell, literally, until high school, until I was a musician in a rock band. That's the only and first chance I had to break out of my shell and go, I'm okay. I can do this. There are girls around me for the first time in my life. They're not liking me because of my scholastic skills. They're certainly <laughs> not liking me because I stand out as a as an Adonis among my classmates, um, they're liking me for one reason and one reason only. I'm playing music. And In the Crossfires. Was, was it the, cro the Crossfires? Cross cross yeah. yeah. In fact, the first band was the Night Riders. 
And then we changed the name uh, to the Crossfires when we acquired a new drummer and, and lost and changed the rhythm player. It was as the Crossfires, um, a five-piece band, uh, that Mark Volman saw us for the first time playing at a, at a high school dance and uh, came up to me at, uh, at lunch the next day and said, gee, you guys are a really great band. I'd really like to join it. And I knew that Mark was in choir with me. Um, and I knew he was a funny guy and rather popular among the surfers of the school, but I had no idea why he would want to join our band. And so I asked him, what, what is it exactly that you play? And he said, uh, nothing. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to ask our lead guitar player a little later then, and, and if you make it, that'll be great. I'll, I'll see you soon. But I couldn't believe it. What do you mean you play nothing and you want to be in our band? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. So I had this little meeting with our lead guitar player, and I said, you know this guy, Mark Bowman? Oh, yeah, he's like the class clown. Well, he wants to be in our band. Yeah, what does he play? Nothing. Hmm. Maybe we should audition him. What? So we wound up auditioning the guy. He could, he knew all the dirty verses to what I say and to Louie Louie and to money. And we thought, wow, just those three songs along with this idiot up there on stage dropping tambourines and kind of spitting on the front row, this might be what we need to grab a little attention from our Westchester classmates. And it worked. That was exactly what they wanted. They, in fact, I figured out later on wanted me to do a rather straight vocals and, and for Mark to be the class clown that he always had been. So without really knowing it, very, very early on in the crossfires, we began to take on this persona of the straight lead singer and the crazy sidekick. And it was Louis very- Prima and Keely Smith. That's where you got that. You said that. Yeah, we got it from Louis Prima and Keely Smith. The call of the wildest. Um, if you kids, and I use the term kids advisedly because almost anyone I see is younger than I am these days, um, you gotta, you gotta get yourself some Louis Prima and Keely Smith. If you want to know where it all came from, where humor in music came from, where Frank Zappa got his fix, uh, it wasn't just Spike Jones. It was. Louis Prima and Keely Smith. It was Martin and Lewis. It was all these great comic teams and their titans. The only thing great comic teams have always had in common is that there's a comedian and a straight man. And that's the way we still play it. Um, Mark has to stay zany, whether he wants to or not. It's his visual image. It's his persona. And it gives him the stage personality that I can play off by just totally trying to ignore that guy. And the audience gets it. How can he be disrupting your act? You're trying to do a straight solo song here. And this guy is dropping tambourines all around you and playing guitar behind his back and and being a total goofball. And it totally works. It totally works. Because age dissipates. It goes away. When you see somebody that uninhibited and that wacky on a stage doing it after all this time, um, I don't know if you feel sorry for him or if you want to donate to his charity or if you just plain appreciate the fact that he can still maintain a sense of humor after all these years of repetition, uh, after after knowing that he's a full-time professor at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee, in the music industry department. Um, he knows exactly what he's doing. We both do. Our roles right. are defined by our characters. Uh, the fact that we're grown-ups now has nothing to do with the fact that we know our place in the rock pantheon and we know our place um, comically, comedically as well as musically. I think that's that's been a very important factor in our survival all these years. I want to ask you something. You um, you got high with some people that would make us all go crazy. First of all, you got high with, now, how many of these people were there? You got high with Morris Soupman, Soupman and I don't know if Black Tooth and White Fang were there, and Frank Zappa. Now, Soupy Sales? Yeah. Howard? Yeah. <laughs> he was my idol. As a kid... 
as a very young kid, uh, when I first moved to California, I had not known Soupy in New York as a personality. Uh, I had not known him from his Detroit days. All I knew was when I got to California, there was this guy on TV that I couldn't believe how funny he was. He touched every bit of my old school funny bone because I kind of grew up on those uh, comedians from black and white motion pictures and, and early television days, Ernie Kovacs and, and those kind of people. And he kind of bridged the gap. And all of a sudden I could see my way clear. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, it was very easy for me. Uh, I knew at such an early age, in fact, that everything else that I did uh, between that recognition, probably at the age of 10, and my graduation uh, from high school at the age of 17, uh, was aiming toward that goal. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. My parents couldn't dissuade me, um, even though they wanted me to be a professional, obviously. They couldn't believe it when, when I quit college and told them that I, I had to do this. I had to do this. Uh, it was a drive that I could not stop. Howard, but yeah, my Soupy, kid, Soupy Sales, yeah, Soupy Sales, and, and to get to your question, um, uh, and Frank Zappa, and he was anti, yeah, yeah, Frank Zappa too, uh, the stranger people than that probably, but those two people stand out in my mind as well, Soupy, because I couldn't believe it, number one, number two, he was higher than I had ever been, and number three, <sighs> He was able to go across the hallway and come back with Pookie on his hands. Uh, and man, let me tell you, do you think you've seen laughter when you've seen guys as, as screwed up as we were with our idol, Soupy Sales, doing those voices, doing those bits, doing peaches from outside the door. I mean, doing everything that we had grown up with, laughing our asses off. And now here he was with us appreciating our music and, 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 and treating us as equals. It wasn't so much the, the, the social bit about being high with him as much as it was acceptance as show business equals that I think was the strongest part of that night for me. Um, and getting to know him uh, for the rest of his life uh, was very, very important to me. Um, when Soupy's autobiography came out, the first picture in that book is a picture of Soupy and Mark and me. And uh, that's holy. As far as I'm concerned, wow. um, that's a very holy thing. I loved that man. Uh, I loved his comedy. I loved him on and off stage equally. Um, so, yeah, uh, that was very important. <clears throat> as far as Frank Zappa was concerned, everybody in the world knew uh, that Mr. Zappa's anti-drug, anti-drink attitude um, was prevalent through his music. Uh, he made it known throughout his interviews uh, that not only did he not do that stuff, but he did not suffer fools gladly, and he would not work with the people who did. So uh, in the book, there is the rather famous tale of now uh, us attending our first rehearsals with the Mothers of Invention, and Mark and I being there at Frank's rehearsal hall before Frank arrived, and famously uh, sparking up a doob, as they say, in the rehearsal hall, maybe 10 minutes before Frank arrived. And when he showed up and smelled the inside of that hall, he came down on us like a ton of bricks. You know, what do you guys think you're doing? Uh, well, Frank, uh, no, no, no. It wasn't about the drugs, really, at that point. It was about the fact that the drugs had been done in the hall that he leased with his name on it. And hmm. if there were any legal repercussions, it would come back to bite Frank in the face, not us. He was absolutely right. Uh, we were inconsiderate on that level. We didn't really think about it in those terms. And we promised Frank it would absolutely never happen again. So the next day when Frank shut <laughs> up and smelled pot all over the place, we had to remind him, Frank, we're outside the rehearsal hall now. We're not inside. You don't own the outside. And he said, yeah, but you guys, we spent 12 days yesterday rehearsing the most intricate music I know you have ever performed in your life. And now you're out here in the parking lot 
getting artificially high, changing your mind, and you expect to go into that rehearsal hall as sharp as you came out last night? Yeah, Frank, we do. Test us. So he did. He had us run through every single thing, note by note, that we learned yesterday, uh, and it was perfect. And he just said, all right, all right, look, just don't do it around me, okay? Just be careful. And know this. Know that if you're stopped at the Czechoslovakian border, I don't know you. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. So we never had to worry about it again. It never came up again. Um, there was never any such um, situation where we were in trouble or, or even in jeopardy um, about our drug use uh, with Mr. Zappa. And later in our careers, uh, when we became closer as a band with Frank, with Ainsley, with the other members of that core, um, Frank did smoke with us. Uh, I know that many people, including Gail Zappa, refuse to this day to believe that Frank got high with us, but I don't give a crap what she <laughs> said, because I was there and she wasn't. Um, the same is true for most of the things that Gail Zappa says, in fact. Um, so I don't really put a lot of credence into uh, anything that comes out of the Zappa Family Trust these days. We did one show with Dweezil a couple of years ago, Mark and me, just to prove to everybody and to ourselves uh, that we could still have fun doing Frank's material. But the way Dweezil runs that band, um, the lack of humor in that group, the, um, the fact that Dweezil really wanted to hear us do the exact same verbatim dialogue that we had done on Just Another Band from L.A. and the White Fillmore album. And we had to take Dweezil aside and say, look, kid, these recordings were made one night at a time. Uh, we never did the same show twice. I don't know what you're talking about, about that routine that we did on the White album where I say this and Mark says that and then I say this. That's not the way we work. It's spontaneous. And if you don't like it, then you're not your dad, then you don't have a sense of humor, then you're in the business not of creation, but recreation, and we got to say, we're out, we bail. Uh, wow. We did the one show with Dweezil, I will never work with him again, that's not the way Frank would have wanted it. Frank was spontaneous, he never played a solo the same way twice. We never did Billy the Mountain the same way twice. It was always new jokes. The idea was to make Frank laugh. In Dweezil's world, the idea is to do everything note for note the way he heard it on one particular night on one particular record, and that's just not what we do. So when he was asked after the concert what it was like to work with Flo and Eddie, I believe he said something like, well, it was kind of disappointing. I, I really wanted them to do the stuff exactly the way they had done it. <laughs> I, I don't understand that kind of consciousness. I don't understand that lack of humor. And I couldn't work with anybody who can't put his tongue in cheek when he's singing about stupid things. These guys, and I don't just limit it to Dweezil. I know that recently uh, there was a 200 Boats House concert in London with the London Philharmonic and it was sanctioned by the family and everybody showed up and there were people there playing all the parts that we played in 200 motels specifically. Um, so there was a, a, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, a Puerto Rican gentleman that was singing the part of Howard. Uh, there was another quite slim blonde guy with curly hair who was singing the part of Mark. And they were singing words that Frank had written for us to say that were taken from our bus ride or from our jokes, or from our private inside little gags that we had with each other. And these guys are mispronouncing the names of streets and they're saying things that they don't understand and they're calling each other Howard and Mark. And I just look at the whole thing and I go, these guys don't get it at all meaning the Zappa family. They just well. don't get it at all. Um, I, I, can't, I, will, I can't work with them ever again. 
Uh, I don't know. They know that, but they know it now. I can't ever work with those people again. They're all totally insane, and they truly believe that, that everything Frank did is in stone and needs to be revered, whereas he would go out every night not knowing what the hell he was going to do, and the fact that we could come off getting some laughs and getting some great solos and getting audiences to come back is a testament to his way of doing it and uh, and an anti-theory to Dweezels. It just doesn't work that way, kid. If you don't have a sense of humor, don't sing Yellow Snow. <laughs> We're talking to Howard Kale in the book, Shell Shocked, available on Amazon or where legal digital downloads are found, and Howard Kalen with a Y dot com. We only have a couple minutes left. It, you know, when we talk to people who, who write books of this type, uh, we could we could come up with some things from the book and it'll tell the whole book. There's so much in here, Howard, that that you cover, and what you've talked about here in this interview is all in the book. Uh, there's just a couple of things I'd like to talk about. We talked about this before. When my kids were born, my first words to them were, you're my pride and joy, etc." One of my favorite songs. That I, was, that, I looked Mark. at my kids when they were born. I, there was a line that I use on my radio show today. It's just something that stuck with me. And then I find that you wrote that song to piss off the record companies. Yeah, and it didn't work. <laughs> I thought, you know, we had we had a lot of hit records. We had the Happy Together, of course, uh, popping the charts in 67, and we followed that up with a whole lot of hits. Uh, she'd rather be with me, and you know what I mean, and she's my girl, and they were all top ten records, and it still wasn't enough for our crappy little record company. They kept saying, why don't you guys just give us another happy together? That's not a lot to ask. That's all we want is just give us another happy together. And it got to be upsetting. I mean, when you see your, your most current record and it's heading up the charts and it's already a top ten song and your record company is denying that it's even important, we don't need that top ten song. What we need from you is another number one record. Give us happy together again. Well, we didn't write Happy Together. It was written by two authors, uh, composers by the name of uh, Gary Bonner and Alan Gordon from New York City. And uh, we loved those guys, but by the time we had gotten this far in our careers, they had already broken up. They had written hit songs for Three Dark Night and Petula Clark and a bunch of other people couldn't get along with each other, broke up their partnership, wouldn't write again for anybody. So them yelling at us, happy together, happy together. I got so frustrated that one day in Chicago uh, at the hotel, we always stayed at the Astor Tower. I, uh, I locked myself in my suite. Uh, we lived big. And uh, I didn't come out until an hour or so later. And I took the song Happy Together. I was so pissed off at these guys that I analyzed Happy Together. And every time its chords went up, the chords of my song went down. Every time the melody did this stupid change, I would make sure I would write the song with this stupid change. And I added, I added such inane, simplistic, teenage hyperbole of words that I figured nobody in their right minds would look at this and not go, get me this Kalen guy on the phone. What are you doing? Why are you doing this to us? Are you doing this to piss us off? That's the reaction I wanted. So when I wrote lines like, you're my pride and joy, etc., or your folks hate me, or all of those little teenage innuendos that are in that song, it was... Gee, I think your swell was that one of them, too? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I wanted those guys to cringe. I wanted them to go, oh, I see. I see. We've been doing this all wrong. We're coming at this in the wrong way. Let these adults come up with their own solution. But instead... They got the demo and said, this is the best thing you've ever written. We booked the studio time. You're in next Friday. This is going to be the biggest hit you've ever had. What? What? You don't get it. It's not supposed to be a hit. It was supposed to be a joke. Well, the joke was on me because we did record it. It did turn out beautifully. Chip Douglas did a great job with the production on that record. 
It has a sound that's even unlike the happy together sound. It is so rich and full and sounds so great that, okay, it was a good record. And then all of a sudden we were back on the charts again, our third time around. Um, we just wouldn't go away. Uh, and so we had that. We had You Showed Me, which was off the same record. Uh, and at that point, um, we did a very smart business thing to do, which was to go in and audit White Whale's books, our record company's books. Because it seemed to us, you know, we've been selling so many records for so many years. How come we don't have any money? Uh, so we sent the uh, Harry Fox agency... Uh, as they will, in to do an audit, uh, and they came up with a huge discrepancy for a six-month period in 1969. Uh, based on that, we sued our record company. We won the lawsuit. They were crooks. Uh, they had no money left or hardly any money at all by the time we reached them. I think to maybe a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars left. But what they did have that we wanted was the name Turtles, which we had not been able to use in all of our time with Frank Zappa. Uh, we had to call ourselves something else. We made up the name Flo and Eddie just because it made Frank laugh. We and I just want to say that you do, you do explain in the book where Fluorescent Leech and Eddie come from. I don't want you to tell it here. Let people go to the book. I oh, think yeah. that's great. Everything is explained. All things are explained. Uh, so how we got out of that lawsuit is explained. How we got our masters yeah. and the right to use the name Turtles is explained. And then yeah. many other areas are delved into, not just our career, but as you know, uh, shortly after Frank Zappa, we began singing on all the records with T-Rex and, uh, and, and made quite a career of ourselves after that doing background singing for everybody from Blondie to to the Ramones, to Duran Duran, to Bruce Springsteen, and all of those stories are in the book as well. And we did monster tours afterward uh, with uh, Jefferson Starship and Stephen Stills and, and a lot of other people, and we had road tragedies and intrigue and drug stories and uh, some of our later days as uh, the Turtles and Flo and Eddie were just rife with nightmares. Um, horrible business decisions and things that came back to haunt us and uh, drug-related uh, problems and dealer-related problems and record companies. Everything I could sandwich in there, including the five wives you alluded to, are all uh, sandwiched in the pages of Shell Shock, uh, as well as some incredible pictures. And I've got to add that if you're too lazy to read a book that would take you nine hours to read, there is an audible version as well where I read the book for you. And that's available on Amazon. No, yeah, but it's available through audible.com. Okay. Anyway, so you can get that as well. Yes, absolutely. And the book is available for Kindle, Nook, and iBooks as well as a regular paper book, which you can get through uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any place fine books are sold. Probably and you're going to. On the road too. You're also going to hear about uh, Herb Cohen. Now, me being Jewish, everybody in my high school graduating class was uh, Herb Cohen, except for me. I'm Mark Berman. So uh, you're going to hear about Herb Cohen in here. You're going to talk about your cousin, Herb. He was a cousin. My cousin, Herb. He was, at, cousin he was at your bar mitzvah. He was at your yeah. bar mitzvah. Yeah. And he was at my bar mitzvah. He was the guy that my mother warned me to stay away from. He was the black sheep of the family that managed Lenny Bruce. I didn't want it's to in the book. with that guy. That's in the book. Yep. And Frank Zappa. Yeah. And Frank so Zappa. It's, and Tim it's Buckley. And there. Linda Ronstadt. It's all in See, there. See, this book is, it, I'll tell you what, people. Seriously, it's a quick read. It, it's it's not going to take you weeks. However, you're going to come away a changed person. If you're a baby boomer and you don't read this book, then a part of your life will be missing. Because hey, this you know book what? was Thank a big part of all of that. our lives. I appreciate uh, that. I think I think if you're a kid in a band growing up and you want to know what's ahead of you, it's a good idea to read this book too. So you're you're reading it as more of a cautionary tale. Don't make the same mistakes I did, please. This is Howard Callen. Can we get you back sometime down the road? Can we get you back on here? I need Absolutely. you back on here. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> we're, we're coming through your neck of the woods in uh, June, July, August. 
uh, we'll be around anyway. But sure, I'd love to talk to you before then, Mark. The Happy Together Tour goes out. And uh, part of that tour, I just want to tell everybody who's listening, uh, on many of the dates is Gary Lewis. And Gary and Howard got their draft notices around the same time. The book explains exactly what happened, um, who they lost as a friend, and who went into the service, who didn't go into the service. Listen, it's about our time. This is what everybody went through. In Philadelphia, we had a place called the Electric Factory. He played the Fillmore all the time uh, with the Turtles and uh, we're with Zappa. And so it's all outlined in this incredible read. Shell-shocked, my life with the Turtles, Flo and Eddie and Frank Zappa, etc. By the way, I just want to say that uh, until I read the book, I thought when I talked to you, I was going to have to say, and he was the lead singer of the Turtles, T Y R T L E S. Uh, so uh, I'm glad, <laughs> I thought I'd have to. I thought I would have to uh, spell it out. Uh, Howard, if you hold the line, I'm going to talk to you off air. You and to my listeners, listen. After you hear this, we're going to be happy together. Ah, cool. Oh.